everyone. Like, I, like they said, this is a, a talk on pager equity. Um, and don't worry, I will define both of those things pretty quickly. All right. So I'm mostly going to be talking about my background, so I'm going to go over what my experience is a little bit. Um, I work for Heroku, and Heroku's basic business model is that we take the operations out of the hands of developers, which means I've probably carried a pager for some of you in the audience. Um, what this means is that our environment is very high pressure because we have a lot of customers whose operations depend on us, and if our operations aren't very good, then they're going to go somewhere else. Um, and it also means we have a very complicated, distributed system, very heterogeneous, a lot of moving parts, basically the opposite of what you want if you're trying to keep a system up and running. I also don't live in Boston. I live in New York City, um, which will become relevant a little bit later in the talk. And most importantly, I am a dog mom. I have two dogs that I raise with my fiance and her lovely wife. Um, and as it is National Dog Day, I am going to be peppering pictures of Flurry throughout the rest of my slides. So you're going to get used to her smiling face. So I'm going to define rotations first and pager burden. Um, so weekly rotations are what I'm used to. I am secondary and primary, uh, which I'll talk about in a little bit for two weeks, roughly out of every three months, which is pretty good. It used to be I was on once every two weeks out of every four weeks, which is not very much fun. Um, but there's a bunch of other ways to do this. Some people do what's called follow the sun, which is where you're only on call during your daytime and somebody in another time zone takes over at night. That might be 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. It might be 1 p.m. to 1 a.m. if you're not very lucky. So, and there are people who are always on call, who are the only operations person for their entire company. And if that's you, then there's a really good resume fair going on outside. And you might want to think about passing yours out. So, now I'm going to tell you what equity is. So, equity is a term you might not know unless you're a social justice warrior. Uh, but equality is sort of how you might think of a pager rotation. Everybody is on call for the same amount of time. Um, they handle the same pages. They run the same services. Um, but that's not quite equal. So equality, in this analogy, the fence is the on-call experience pretty homogenous. You know, you might have a good week or a bad week, but for the most part, that's something that everything, everyone has to deal with. Um, and the little heights of the people here, that's your ability to do on call and what your experience is like. And the crate is how much support you have as an on call engineer. So in the first scenario, everybody has, you know, the same tooling available, but maybe not much support from their colleagues. And in the second scenario, some people who need a bunch of support get it from their colleagues, and others who maybe don't need as much of it can provide it. Um, and the, there's a variant of this graphic that shows no fence that says the barriers are removed. But unfortunately, we can't really get rid of our on-call rotations. So that's not going to work. And the first thing I'm going to talk about is the people. Um, the ways that on-call affects different people are not nearly as obvious as how tall they are. And many of them have social stigma associated with them, so that it's difficult for somebody to talk to them, or they might be embarrassed about it. And so a lot of you might not even know that these issues are happening on your team. Um, and I just want to raise awareness of what these issues are, because if you're aware of what your coworkers are going through, you can be empathetic, you can support each other more effective, and you're going to have a more productive team overall. So the first one I'm going to talk about is geographic location. Um, my team is geographically distributed. We have people in 
three countries scattered all over the North American and European continents. So if your team is all in one place, this might not apply as much to you. But some of my colleagues are, live in rural areas, and that means they probably use a car to drive everywhere. And that can be a good thing, because if you're in a car, just bring your laptop with you. If you have to pull over, you've got a warm, dry place to take care of whatever thing has come up. But it also means, if you're really rural, there might not be any cell signal. So you might have to be careful about which roads you take, because you know there's a pager dead zone on Highway 6. Um, and it also might mean you have high latency, poor internet. If you're on satellite internet and you have to troubleshoot something in a stressful situation, that latency is really going to add to your stress. And on the other side, there's me, who live in a very urban area, and most of the way I get around is the subway. In Boston, you're all very lucky because the subway has cell signal basically throughout it, but in New York, there's one or two very large stations that have it, and other than that, pretty much a dead zone. And because it takes me so long to get from where I live in Brooklyn to where I need to go in Manhattan, that means I can do upwards of 45 minutes of blackout time, which obviously isn't going to work for anybody's SLA. If you're, if you're able to take buses, that can work pretty well, although in New York, they're sort of subservient to the subway, so <clears throat> generally you can't take a bus somewhere a subway already goes. Um, one of the nice things about a very dense city like mine is that you can walk to places, but even a 15 minute walk might be too much for me because if I get paged in the middle, I'm gonna have to set it down on somebody's steps and try to sort out a problem. And maybe you can't really go for a walk at all. Maybe you have physical disabilities or maybe you just don't have anything nearby that's worth walking to. So that might not work for you. And all of these factors can have an impact on your social life. Um, I think probably most of you know about introverts and extroverts. Introverts are broadly defined as people who sort of recharge their batteries while they're by themselves. And introverts are people who charge their batteries from hanging out with other people. And it's obviously not quite that fine a line. It's a little bit more fuzzy than that. But for the most part, I would call myself an introvert. Um, or sorry, I would call myself an extrovert. But that means that if I'm on call, and I can't go out and go visit my friends who live in Manhattan, I'm not going to get to see them, and I'm gonna be pretty sad. So can you go out while you're on call? Is outside of the issues of whether your pager works outside, maybe if you're getting page constantly, you're not gonna wanna go to do something. And maybe you can just throw it in your bag and do whatever you want, and this doesn't affect you. Um, and more importantly, how does one week, two week, three weeks, however many weeks out of your shift feel when it really disrupts your social calendar? How does that affect your well-being? How does that affect your happiness as an engineer? Um, sometimes you can bring your laptop with you if you're lucky. If you're going to a house party and you get paged, you can probably find a room off to the side and sort that out. If you're going rock climbing, maybe not so much. Maybe you have to climb down very, very quickly if you get paged, all the while a really annoying buzzer that everybody can hear is going off. And if you're going to a movie, don't bring your pager. Don't be that jerk. So my social life is very important to me, and if I don't feel fulfilled in my social life, it starts to affect my mental health. So on-call can have a very deep and stressful impact on all sorts of people who have mental health problems. Um, even a very quiet on-call shift with basically no pages can have me constantly checking my phone, constantly making sure that the paging infrastructure is working. If I don't get paged, it actually worries me more because I worry about what I'm missing and whether everything is working properly. Um, but I often don't talk about these sorts of things with my team because talking about mental health in the work workplace is still very stigmatized and still very intimate. And 
not the sort of part of the professional persona I like to present. Um, if you've got more stressful reactions, um, being woken up by a really loud alarm and getting an adrenaline kick in the middle of the night can provoke panic responses in people who are prone to that sort of thing. Um, and maybe you're lucky and this sort of thing doesn't affect you. Um, and you think it's just being paged. No big deal. Why would I worry about that? But this does affect a lot of people and it really affects their happiness and their well-being while they're on call. So these people need more support. Um, and one of the things that easily makes my mental health worse is that when I'm on call, I don't always get enough sleep. If you're on follow the sun and your turnover time is before bed, great. You don't have to worry about this slide at all. But if you're like me and you're on call 24-7 for two weeks, it can take a toll on you, especially if you've been woken up multiple nights in a row. Um, and for me, the less sleep I get, the more stress, the more anxious, the more everything I'm going to be during the day. And that really has an impact on me, especially after a couple nights in a row. Um, and even outside of mental health, if you don't get enough rest, you're going to get sicker, you're going to be tired during the day, you're going to be less productive, maybe so less productive that you can't fix the thing that's waking you up in the first place. Um, one of the things that my team does that's pretty good is if you are paged, you can sleep in as much as you want the next day. Nobody expects you to show up for a 9 a.m. meeting. But if I had, say, kids that I had to take to school or I had a dog who wakes me up every morning at 6 a.m., it's going to be hard for me to sleep in and take advantage of that time, which means those, those hours are just lost. And even if I don't, I only get paged once, not everybody can just sort of fall back to sleep after that sort of adrenaline rush. Even if I resolve a page inside of five minutes, it might take me an hour before I feel tired enough to go back to sleep or before I feel comfortable that the issue is resolved. So one tiny interruption in the middle of the night can turn an otherwise quiet night into basically you staring wide awake at Twitter because you can't get back to sleep. Um, and the other thing is that me being paged in the middle of the night doesn't just affect me because I have a fiance and her wife who sleep in the same bed as me, which means if I get woken up, odds are good they're all going to get woken up too. Um, if you have kids who have crawled into bed with you, they will get woken up. Can they get back to sleep? Does your spouse have insomnia problems, even if maybe you don't? So. Being on call is something that is broadly shared across a household. And somebody who usually sleeps by themselves probably wouldn't experience that in quite the same way. Um, and outside of nighttime during the day, you might be missing social events and your friends might not get to see you. You might not be able to go rock climbing and then your partner can't go either. You're, you might be missed at the weekly D&D &D group and your party gets wiped because you weren't there to save them. You might miss your best friend's birthday party because you're not able to get time off and there's no cell signal in the basement where she's holding her party. Um, so it can really affect other people around you if you have to sort of withdraw into this on-call mode. Um, and at the bottom here, does your dog still get walked? Flurry over there is complete menace if she hasn't been walked for a good hour every day. Luckily, I have the rest of my house to help me take care of her, but if it was just me and I couldn't get her out the door because the pager kept going off, that would be pretty bad for her too. And there's a lot more things like that where you're on call, even if nobody else has to do anything when you get paged, still affect you a lot. Um, and another very big difference between people on call is that you probably have a spectrum of junior employees to senior employees, or you might have experts in one component who are very uncertain with another component your team's also responsible for. 
my team has a very large surface area and we don't do a very good job of training people in the operations. Um, and a thing that I see at a lot of workplaces is they have sort of oral tradition documentation where there's just a bunch of knowledge that people have accumulated and they talk to each other about, but there aren't written playbooks, there aren't guides, there aren't graph expectations, that sort of thing. Um, and even if you might remember something at 3 p.m., maybe 3 a.m. is a little bit harder for you to rack your brain for whatever it is that your colleague told you about fixing this one very specific bug that only cr comes up once every six weeks. An expert might say, oh, so I see this spike in this graph and I'm getting this error message, which means I have to fix this problem. It's done and I go back to bed. Whereas for someone like me, not as a bit of an expert, you have to say, okay, where's the run book? All right, my credentials for this service are out of date. I have to refresh them. Is the graph supposed to look like that? It looks very spiky, but maybe it always does. And I think I've fixed the issue, but I don't really know. I'm not sure if it's just gonna happen again in five minutes, so I better stay up for an extra 20 minutes just to make sure that things are okay. And that means what took the expert five minutes to resolve might take me half an hour or longer. Um, and the other thing that can be very stressful is if you don't know how to fix something, can you get help? Are there other people who are on call or are you just calling people randomly and hoping their phones aren't on silent? We have escalation paths, so we have rotations for every component we maintain and experts for that which means if I get in over my head, there's somebody for me to call for backup. Um, and this is a good thing for everyone involved because it means I get to sleep more, it means the service is up for longer, um, more nines in our uptime numbers, and it means that everybody is going to be happier the next day. I'll have learned how to fix this problem. So having that sort of backup is very important and something you might not consider if you're one of the senior engineers who is pretty knowledgeable and can fix everything just by waving their hands half in their sleep. So now I'm gonna talk about the boxes. Um, I've been a little bit doom and gloom uh, with all of the ways that we're not equal, but now I'm gonna talk about how our taller people, so to speak, can move their burdens around to help the people who are having a lot more trouble. Um, and the first thing I wanna talk about is pager overrides because these are the key tool that I use to keep myself sane. So a pager override is basically when somebody else overrides your shift of the schedule. For me, it might be two hours so I can go to a doctor's appointment. It might be all day so that I can go to a wedding that just happened to happen during my on-call shift. Um, but asking for these can be very difficult, especially if you're newly established on the team and you have a lot to prove. It's very difficult for people to just step up and say, I, I can't do this, I really have to go do this other thing. It burns a lot of social capital and it requires that you already sort of be well established, well liked, that sort of thing. Um, so the real way to fix this is you have to make it a deep part of your team's culture that we're all in this together. Every on-call shift is not just one person fending for themselves. Everybody's job is always to make the service better. It's always everybody's job to make sure that the engineers feel supported. Um, and you should foster a culture where asking for overrides is totally normal. Happens four or five times a day. And everybody always steps up because they know somebody is going to step up for them later. Um, but even if you do all of that, it's good to remember that there are social pressures, especially, especially that more diverse members of your team might face, and it's always gonna be harder for some people to ask for overrides than others. Um, and another thing you can do that will make everything much smoother for employees is that you have to have very clear expectations for what you're responsible for doing on call. You need to know what needs to be done before I start my shift. What credentials do I need? Where are the playbooks? How do I make sure the pager's working? 
How is everything set up? Because if you don't have this, I'm just going to worry that I mix, missed a step every single time. I have lists for everything. I have a list for when I'm packing. I have a list for when I'm going out for dinner. I have a list for when I'm about to go on call and what I need to bring, what I need to have to make sure that I'm going to be successful. Um, and what do you need to do while you're on call? Do you just sort of lie back and hope the pager doesn't go off? Are there graphs that you need to keep an eye on to make sure everything's okay? Are there services you should be manually monitoring because they haven't been broken in yet and we don't really understand um, what their performance characteristics are and we might not know when, whether the pages work for them. Make sure all of that is super clear because employees are not going to know what exactly it is they need to be done unless they've been doing this for a long time. So this is a way to make it much easier for people who are easily prone to stress or new on the team or anybody else who doesn't quite know the drill yet. The other thing that has a very big impact on my quality of life is what is your team's SLA? Um, what I mean by that is how long does it take before somebody has to pick up the pager? At what time do you expect someone to step in and answer something before it either is passed on to the next person or is escalated to the entire team? Because the difference between five minutes and 15 minutes means if it's five minutes, I can walk 10 minutes to something if because I can get to the other side if I get paged, or I can get ho go home if I get paged. But if my SLA was 20 minutes, suddenly I can take a bus for 20 minutes, I can go walking for 40 minutes, and take my dog out. So this has a very big impact of, on your quality of life, and you should not just be thinking as soon as possible. Everybody wants all of the problems to be resolved right away, but as soon as possible places some stress more on some people more than others because as soon as possible might mean two minutes to me, but 10 minutes to the more experienced person who knows that nothing's really on fire and this page isn't that important. So clearly define this and think really hard about what it is and why it is that. Think about what your customers need. Think about contractual requirements you have. Think about what you need to do to keep your service up enough, but not burn out all of your engineers who have to be able to respond at the drop of a pin. Um, a lot of people have a secondary, but the jobs that they have vary widely. Um, on some of the teams, the secondary on-call has responsibilities during the day while they're online. The secondary is responsible for reviewing pull requests, for merging things, for doing some operational tasks and the primary might be responsible for chasing up any issues that woke them up in the night or doing maintenance chores, um, that sort of thing. But if you do have a secondary, are you allowed to say, hey, I'm gonna go do this thing, can you handle the pager for a second? Do you have, do you need to know what the responsibilities are for the secondary or do you have to be redundant so if you want to go, if either of you need coverage, somebody else is going to have to ask. You should make those expectations really clear so that the secondary isn't just as stressed as the primary. Um, and if something goes wrong, it should be very clear who you ask for help. Um, so, like I said, we have escalation paths. You might just have to page other people directly but it should be clear what you can fix and who you can talk to to fix it. Um, and a sort of extension of that is that you should back your engineers up and back your team up. Um, everybody should, everybody wants your engineers to succeed. Everybody wants your service to be up, to be healthy, your engineers not to burn, be burnt out, engineers not to be productive, so you have to make sure they have the support to make this work. That, in, that, in, that means taking time off of feature work to write really good documentation so you can resolve incidents faster. That means even if you're in the middle of a big project, if something's paging me in the middle of the night, 
give me time to fix that and give me the resources, which might be people, which might be more servers, that I need to fix that. You should, meme you should be backing your engineers up because they're the one who are keeping the service up and who are keeping the lights on. And as a sort of final note, you should pay people who are on call more than regular developers because it is a very big impact on a lot of people's lives and a very big impact that is more than just maybe you get paged once in a while. You shouldn't be compensated for those 15 minutes where you're actually working. You should be compensated for all that time when you're modifying your life to fit the container of your on-call responsibility. Um, thank you all very much. I can take any questions if you have them.